he has been on hold for these whole three years too, kept re-upping our contract. And uh, his story, he'll tell himself, but he was a college uh, pitcher headed for the majors. Most wild pitches in a game? Yeah, most wild pitches in a game. Um, his major career uh, went where you would imagine. And through that adversity, he was determined to complete the BUDS training program to become a Navy SEAL, which he did. Completed successful campaigns uh, overseas, fighting for our country. Thank you. And has translated those lessons. I mean, when the consequences of poor performance is death, um, translating those fundamentals into what can help corporate America or professional athletes, because he does both, is uh, really amazing and can absolutely be done. So, Jason, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie. Oh. I'm, yeah, I'm like that for you. Thank you very much. Yes, as Jeannie said, my name is Jason Kuhn. I'm a performance coach. And before that, I was a Navy SEAL. Now, when I signed up for the SEAL teams, or to attempt to become a Navy SEAL, it was still pretty secretive. But now, pretty much everybody's heard of it. There's another book or TV show or movie coming out all of the time. And it was some of the best times of my life to become a Navy SEAL is very difficult. Has anybody seen any of those movies or videos on YouTube of BUDS training, basic underwater demolition SEAL training, or uh, Hell Week, right? So BUDS is a six-month-long process. And the hardest part of BUDS is Hell Week, and that's the fourth or fifth week in the training. And Hell Week is five and a half days you're cold, wet, miserable, hypothermic conditions the entire time. They say we run over 200 miles that week. It's 22 hours of grueling activity every day, stopping only to eat or get medical checks. You don't sleep, really, at all. We say you sleep for four hours, but it's hard to fall asleep after you've been on the move the entire time and when you're freezing. So it starts on a Sunday, and you don't sleep at all until Wednesday. So you stop and you sleep for two hours and then you sleep for two hours on Thursday. And it's one of the most difficult, and it's also one of the most rewarding experiences of my entire life. Our class had pretty typical numbers. The attrition rate is very high. Anywhere from about 75 to 90% of the people who attempt the training fail to complete it. Most of them quit. They voluntarily drop and decide they just don't want to do this anymore. In my class, we had 135 men start the training. We got to that fourth or fifth week, hell week, we got to that with, I think, 43 guys. And of those 43 hard charge and tough dudes, there were 20 of us left at the end on Friday. Of those 20 guys, 11 of us went on to graduate with our class on time. And I was one of them. From there, I went on to uh, the SEAL teams and had, a, had incredible experiences. And it was everything that I wish I had learned as a young baseball player and as a young man that would have helped prolong and enhance my career. So I've taken those experiences and translated them into a curriculum that I call the Fundamentals of Winning to help increase human performance through the fundamentals of mindset and team first culture. As a baseball player, I played for a top 25 nationally ranked NCAA Division I team. I was an aspiring pitcher, and all I ever wanted to do was play ball. I had no thoughts about joining the military or anything like that, and I was well on the path. I put in the work, did all the things that you're supposed to do, and I imploded. Completely fell flat on my face. I threw six wild pitches in one inning. The record in the NCAA for a game was seven in an entire game. I threw six in one inning. So that was a record set back in 2001. And it's still a record today in 2023, right? So lesson number one, anything worth doing is worth overdoing, right? <laughs> All right. So uh, I imploded there. I was, what happened to me was I got something known as the yips. Has anybody heard of the yips? Yeah, all the golfers are like, don't talk about it, man, the thing, right? <laughs> so that's what happened to me. I completely lost my ability to throw. When I would throw, I would get so full of tension and anxious that my arm would lock up and I couldn't control the baseball. It was one of the most difficult periods of my life, but as I said, I went on to the SEAL teams, learned a lot of things, and a few years later from that implosion in baseball, I found myself in a gunfight. I was pinned down and cut off from my team a call came out over the radio, said, Jason is pinned down and you guys need to get up here now. And we were taking fire from two different directions, pretty close range. And I remember thinking very distinctly in that moment, the actions that I take next are going to determine whether I live or die. And obviously I was able to perform well enough because I'm here, but how do you go from a young man who's so full of tension, anxiety, fear, 
that you can't throw a baseball properly to being able to perform in the extreme environment of life and death combat. And I just want to walk you all through that story a little bit, share those experiences and lessons learned so that you can apply them to your business and to your life. And the first thing is understanding what performance is. So after I imploded in baseball, it was shortly after 9-11, and I decided I'm going to join the Navy and become a SEAL. I'm watching everything I can. I'm reading the books, watching the Discovery Channel videos, and one of them has a reporter, and she asks one of the SEALs, what is it that makes you guys so good? And he laughs, and he says, oh, it's not that we're that good. It's that everybody else sucks. And when he said that, I laughed, too, because I liked him. You know, I liked his attitude. I wanted to be like that guy. He's like, man, that's where I belong, you know? But I didn't really understand what he meant by that until I reflected on my own career as a ball player and as a Navy SEAL. And what I realized about myself as a baseball player was my standard for performance was often based in comparison to the competition. You know, I wanted to be as good or better than the other pitchers on our team to be the best pitcher, or as good or better than the other teams in our conference to be the best team. But that wasn't truly the best standard. You know, when I got to the SEAL teams, we never really compared ourselves to anyone else in terms of who was the best. It wasn't, can we get a little bit better than the rest? The question we asked ourselves was, how good can I get? Maximization of potential was the standard we were held accountable to pursuing every day, both as an individual performer and as a team. And the way we were able to perform well in combat, in my opinion, what performance is, was simply an ability to execute fundamentals under stress. In combat, it's an ability to relentlessly execute fundamentals under extreme stress. And fundamentals are simply controllable actions of value. So what that means to me is no matter what's going on around me, no matter how many people are shooting or what's exploding, you focus on what you can affect and work the problem. And that's a skill that I did not really have on a baseball, on a baseball team. I was very outcome oriented. But what I learned in gunfights is that you cannot force the results, meaning we don't have absolute control over the outcome. If you did and you and I were to compete against each other, we would both win, which isn't possible, so it's nonsensical. So we can't force the results in competitive environments, whether it's combat, whether it's the corporate competition, whether it's a baseball field, only influence them. And if we know that to be true, then our aim as competitors ought to be to influence them to the greatest degree possible. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And the way we do that is by demanding perfection of everything within our control, or at least a pursuit of perfection of everything within our control. We focus on what we can affect, we work the problem, and we eliminate the variables to competition by mastering the fundamentals. I want to know everything about my weapon, I want to know everything about my radios, what all the buttons do, how to fix the malfunctions, be able to do it with my eyes closed in the dark, with a wounded arm, whatever it may be. But the key is that I learned about performance is it's not only about skill sets, how we do what we do. There's also fundamentals, controllable actions of value in the way we choose to think and in the way we interact with each other on a team. So there's fundamentals, the fundamentals of winning. Winning's more dynamic than shooting or execute, executing a sales presentation or swinging a golf club, right? The fundamentals of winning is more dynamic. There's more people involved. There's more moving parts. So the fundamentals exist not only in how we do what we do, but also in how we choose to think and how we, how we choose to treat each other on a daily basis. And all three of those work together to produce best possible outcomes. Right? We can't, as I said, we can't force the results. I could be one of the best trained warriors on earth, and at one point in my life I believed that I was, but I still can't eliminate the possibility of somebody popping up out of a window and shooting me in the back, someone who's possibly untrained. So what I want to do is make myself very dangerous, eliminate the variables, be hard to kill. That's what I'm trying to accomplish, and best outcomes over time creates consistent performance. And consistency creates separation over time, and separation is what makes us elite as we separate ourselves from the pack. And I believe I can prove that it's more than just skill sets because I can teach anyone, you know, instead of going golfing or to the spa, we can go out and learn how to shoot and jump out of a plane, dive. It's not all that hard, and it's a lot of fun. Those are some of the core skill sets of a SEAL. But if I taught you those skill sets, that doesn't necessarily equate to being effective in combat if we went and got ourselves into a fight. So for the skill sets to be useful, we've got to be able to apply them in any environmental condition. And they taught us a phrase that helped tremendously. The environment will not influence my actions. My actions will influence the environment. And I've learned that our actions are going to be determined by the habits created in our preparation, what we do on a daily basis. 
So we can't force the results, but that doesn't mean we become apathetic or surrender control for them. We want to fight for them every day by creating fundamentally sound habits because habits are how we respond when it matters most. We were taught this phrase as well. It goes back to a Greek philosopher. He says, we don't rise to the occasion. We will default to our standard of training in dynamic and adverse situations. But again, not only in how we execute action, but also in the way we choose to think. Am I going to break down in self-pity, or am I going to be selfless and shift my focus into my teammate and fight back? All of that is determined by who you make yourself to be prior to the event occurring. And one of the things that we need to learn, both as a company and as an individual, is identity. Knowing who we are, what our mission is, and why we want to produce it. So coming into my senior season in baseball in college, I had everything in alignment for the draft. It was right there in front of me, and it was hugely important to me because growing up, I overcame a lot of adversity as a young man. I'd fight and stand my ground and you know, had some hard things that I had to come, overcome. So I felt like an, over, an underdog. I felt overlooked a lot, and baseball was where I was going to stick it to everybody, you know, prove that I have what it takes, and I loved that game. I was desperate to keep playing it because it was everything to me. It was who I was. It was where I gained my ego and everything that I valued about myself. And for me, you know, when I made it to the big leagues, I mean, the, the odds are against you, but I believed that I would. Just getting drafted and the chance to play professionally would have been enough for me. I could hang my hat on that and move forward with life, and that's when I imploded. I threw six wild pitches in an inning. As I said, it was the most ever in the NCAA, and it's funny, but at the time, it wasn't. I was lost. I was embarrassed. I was frustrated. I was searching for direction. I tried all the traditional things you're supposed to try. Nothing worked, sports psychology or anything like that, and I thought, hey, man, do this your way. You're a fighter. Fighters fight. So I went to the field, and I wasn't traveling with the team anymore, which was awful, very hard to deal with. So I go to the field on one of those weekends. The team's gone, and I grabbed a bucket of balls and a good buddy, and I just started throwing. And my plan was I'm going to throw until I can again. And I threw for six hours. And at the end of that six hours, almost nonstop, I could hardly move my arm anymore. I couldn't get my elbow above my shoulder. And I was more inaccurate at the end than I was the beginning. And when that happened, I was defeated inside. I didn't know how to fight this. I couldn't punch it. I couldn't outwork it in the weight room. I couldn't outthrow it. People thought I was mentally weak, and that bothered me to my core because I was a pitcher, but I was a closer. So I would come in with the bases loaded and high leverage situations, and I'd always throw strikes and get it done. So to fail in this manner, and back then there was no name, yips, or anything like that. I just thought I'd gone crazy. I couldn't figure it out, and it got dark. So without direction, without purpose, I started drinking a lot. And one day I woke up in my hallway in my dorm room, face down, didn't even make it to my room, clothes still on, hat on, drool all over the floor, peeled my face up off the carpet, and I thought to myself, all right, man, this thing happened. It is what it is. Is it going to define who and what you're going to be for the rest of your life? And I knew I needed to make a change right there, but I also didn't know what to change because I had done so many things right. I had the right attitude. I put in the work and did all the things you're supposed to do. But regardless... I realized in that moment that a victimhood mentality simply produces more victimhood. Self-pity, no matter how justified it may be, is a worthless emotion in an effort to win. Now, I didn't just, you don't just wake up with this problem, okay? There were some really difficult things that I went through in college as well and some external contributors to that. But what matters is what we're going to do about it because when helplessness and self-loathing drive our decisions, it creates hell on earth. And that's where I was at. I had bounced off of every wall, from booze to whatever else, was sitting there broken, so I looked a couple of places that I had not looked yet. I looked to God, and I looked internal. And I stopped in my dorm room there, and I said, I prayed probably for the first time ever in my life, and I just tried to be still and connect to my Creator, and I wasn't saying much, and I started getting tears in my eyes, and these words came out of my mouth. I just said, Jesus, help me. And when I said that, peace came across my soul. Now, I still couldn't throw the ball, and I was still confused, but I wasn't so bitter. I wasn't so angry, and the tension started to leave me. And then as I sat there and I started crying even harder, I said, why? Like, why did this happen? Because if I can wrap my, my head around the purpose of what I'm going through, then I can move forward. And I felt these words on my heart, not, not visibly, not audibly, just on my heart from somewhere other than myself. Just wait, something better is coming for you. And in that moment, 
I believe that there was purpose to what I'm going through. So this isn't a sermon. I'm just telling you the story as it happened. And, but I, I believed that there was purpose to what I was going through. And the performance principle is I reframed it. And I reframed how I viewed the circumstances to make something of it because I thought I'd lost my purpose in life. I was supposed to be a ball player. It was everything to me. And now I was just destined to drift through life in some lesser existence. But when I stopped viewing the circumstances having taken my purpose, and I started viewing it as having purpose for me to be forged into a more capable person is when everything changed. And then I looked internal. And as unfair and hard as this may be, how did I help contribute to the problem? What parts of me need to die? What parts of me are strong and need to continue to be strengthened? And I realized this about myself. I was dependent on the game for my sense of self-worth. I didn't know how to live without it. I didn't know who, who I was without it. And I was terrified of losing it. And it created the subconscious fear. And I knew if I went into the Navy with the attrition rate that Buds has with that same mentality, I'd probably get the same result. So I learned a phrase that helped me a lot through a friend. He said, what I do does not define who I am. Who I am should define what I do. And rather than being dependent on success in the profession for my sense of self-worth, allow my intrinsic sense of self-worth, who I believe myself to be, to create my success within the profession. And that's what transitioned for me and I believe led to my uh, being able to accomplish buds and go on and be a SEAL and perform well in combat. I valued being a Navy SEAL. It's a part of my identity. I value being a baseball player. It's a huge part of my identity. But the shift was I wasn't dependent on the profession for my sense of self-worth. I allow my sense of self-worth to create success within the profession. And I have been so focused on the difficult things in life and the people who helped contribute to them and the failures. And so far ahead on the outcome of the draft, am I going to play professionally that I forgot who I was? And high achievers tend to do that. And there's a lot of high achievers in here, a lot of startups, and it's difficult. And I get that. And so I, I just paused for a moment in that prayer and reflection moment. And I started focusing on the good things. I hadn't done that in a while. And I started thinking about being a kid, standing my ground and fighting, and some of the game-winning hits and a no-hitter that I threw. And I thought to myself, man, that's who you are. You don't need anybody's validation of that. You don't need anybody's affirmation of that. Just be grounded in the truth of it, but channel it into service of team and mission. And that's what I decided to do when I joined the Navy. But in that moment, for the first time probably ever in my life, I was very grounded. I knew exactly who I was. I knew exactly what I wanted. I was going to go be a Navy SEAL or die trying, and I knew exactly why I wanted it and what the meaningful purpose was behind it. It wasn't status, you know, look at me and tell everyone I'm a SEAL or anything. It was 9-11 and watching 3,000 innocent people die on live TV in my dorm room and wanted to help protect the innocent. It was a path for redemption for my failure in baseball and so many other things that formed the deep, meaningful purpose which fueled my desire and fed my discipline. And I was forged through that adversity by having the courage to finally, after a while, it was a bit of a journey, to engage my pain rather than retreat from it and look internal. And I've learned this, that you know I can't remove pain and suffering from anyone, but we can learn how to deal with it. And when we engage the pain, we suffer well. And when we suffer well, we grow in character. And a growth in character makes us more capable. And more capable people can achieve more. And then through that achievement, both what we produce in it tangibly and the lessons learned along the, way, along the way, the intangibles, we can turn around and help other people on a meaningful level. And that's what provides fulfillment in our lives. See, we're not always going to be happy. You know, if we say the goal of life is to be happy, that's going to be a tough goal because it's just not how it works. And, and life's inherently unfair. It's full of imperfect people, to include me and to include you. But we can find fulfillment in our pain according to how we choose to respond to it. And a better response to it assigns greater meaning to it. And competitive environments are difficult, whether it's life itself, business, or the battlefield. But I've learned this. Difficult times is where we leave our legacy. And we all have a unique set of circumstances and experiences, both as an individual and as a company. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what will we do with ours? Spend less time on whose fault it is when the difficult times occur, and what are we going to do about it? Because that's what people are going to remember about us. It's how we write our story. And when things are at their worst is when the greatest opportunities exist. I didn't know that at the time, but everything that it turned into has proven that true to me. Later on, Years later, back in, say, 2018, I met Tyler Matzik. He pitches for the Atlanta Braves. Are there any Atlanta Braves fans out there? 
One, all right, and two, three, okay, all right, four of us are friends here, there we go. Uh, Tyler was out of baseball for five years due to the yips. He had tried everything Major League Baseball had to offer him in terms of sports psychology, saltwater meditation, baths, you name it. I said, hey, bud, I know this problem. I've taught myself how to throw again. We're going to work through it. We trained together for about a year and a half. He got back into the big leagues after that five year uh, of not playing, got with the Atlanta Braves, and in 2021 won the, won the World Series, and, and he's a World Series champion. And none of that would have occurred without that forging. But the response to when we got down there at the World Series and watched him pitch, he struck some guys out, and I hugged my wife with tears in my eyes, and I looked at her and I said, you know, at the time, the yips was the worst thing. It was the hardest time of my life, the worst thing I've ever been through. But now I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me because having lived the life that I've lived, I'd rather be here watching him pitch in the game than pitch in the game myself. But there was meaning to that pain according to the response, and that was very fulfilling. And when we engage our pain, we're forged by adversity, and that makes us resilient. And resilience, I think, is the number one attribute that leads to success in anything that we do. It's very powerful. So I move forward stronger. It's when we get knocked down, we get back up. But not just get back up. Get back up stronger than we got knocked down. So that's what I did, driven not by status or fear of losing what I loved, but by meaningful purpose, knowing exactly who I was, what I wanted, and why I wanted it. And that's where I start with both individual competitors and companies as we ask ourselves that question, to create a baseline for the culture that we want to establish within ourselves. And this is an example of one that I use. And any team that I consult with, this is exactly what we do first. What are we going to be about? What is it that we're trying to accomplish it? What's the purpose driving us to accomplish it? Something that's meaningful, and then a motto and a legacy. What do we want to leave behind when, when, you know, when we turn everything over to someone else or when we leave life one day? So identity. We've got to establish our who, what, why. And responding to adversity and difficult times is not easy. That's where mental toughness comes into play. So in the SEAL teams, I was a sniper and eventually a team leader. And through those experiences, one in particular, I really learned what mental toughness is about. And I believe mental toughness is how we respond to adversity. And adversity is when we meet circumstances that are outside of our control and unfair. And when that happens, it naturally makes us feel frustrated, resentful towards the entities who helped create the situation, and disappointed. And what most people will do, the natural cause and effect cycle, is we will start to complain, blame other people, deflect responsibility off of ourselves. That's because Human beings, we are all self-preserving creatures. Those survival instincts kick in when things are hard, and that's the natural path that we follow unless we intentionally interrupt it. And that's what mental toughness is. It's an ability to interrupt that cause and effect cycle and insert thought and action that produce value regardless of what actions may be justified by the circumstance. So mentally tough people understand they can control two things in adversity, how they react and what they do next. And what we do next will have value or no value. To me, it's that simple. And that's what I think about when I meet cer uh, hard circumstances in life now is, what is my response going to be? And the way to have a valuable response is to shift our focus. It's a pause and it's an intentional shift of focus into two things, right? We shift our focus off of what we can't control, what has happened, Right, initially, that's going to drive our focus and our emotions. We need to know what we're experiencing so we can make a good tactical decision on how to engage it. But then we shift our focus into two things, the execution of action, the process. It doesn't matter how I got here. I'm here. What matters is what I'm going to do about it. And then we shift our focus into our, te into our team. And as leaders, that is vitally important. We shift our focus off of ourselves and into our teammates. And we don't just get through it. We lead the others through it because the majority of our fear comes from self-preservation and the more we're focused on each other the more that goes away and the more we practice that the more it becomes habitual until it's innate in our character and when things go off that's how we respond and that's what buds is really all about more than shooting or anything like that that's the purpose behind hell week that and other things but that's really what it's all about and what helps motivate the shift of focus Right? So I, I know I'm in this adversity because pain is real. It hurts emotionally and physically. So how do we motivate that shift of focus when we really don't want to? How do we stand in the line of fire? Well, understanding the value of something is what helps us fear it less. 
so we understand the value of adversity. Adversity creates a struggle, and the struggle creates opportunity for reward, and there is no reward without the struggle. And the greater the struggle, the greater the reward. That's why our instructors taught us to embrace the suck, man. The harder this gets, the better you get, and the more joy you receive if and when you overcome. And I've learned this in life. The one problem we're always going to have in business and in, and in our personal lives is the problem of having problems. But it's the challenges in life that give us the opportunity for the virtuous action we all admire in each other. And if we can create within ourselves and within our teams mentally tough people who can respond to adversity well, because everybody has to deal with adversity. It's universal. Right? The COVID restrictions and everything that happens, everybody's dealing with that. But if we can respond to things better, tactically better, emotionally better, over time that creates competitive advantages and we gain ground on the competition. We were, uh, in Buff's training, we were running up and down a sand berm. It's about, I'm going the wrong way. It's going, we were, it's about 10 yards high, 10 to 12 yards high, and it's soft sand, and we had been running up and down it for, gosh, a couple hours or so. We had no idea when it was going to end. It's just up and over this hill, back and forth, back and forth. So it's very monotonous. There's not a whole lot of things to distract yourself with. And that sand, it feels like it's turned your thighs inside out as we're running up this hill. And one of the young men starts screaming out in pain. He's grabbing his leg. He says, my leg, my leg. And the instructor swarmed on him. And they gave him the attention he was looking for, but not in the way he was looking for it. They said, it's supposed to be hard. Where do you think you are right now? And that guy quit. We never saw him again. He was focused on the pain in his leg, and he drifted into that victimhood mentality. There's nothing I can do about it. This is unfair. And it led to a decision that he now probably regrets. My swim buddy. You have a swim buddy in Bud's. You never get more than six feet away from him. You know where he is all the time. Your job is to, in combat is to keep him alive and set him up for success. He returns that for you. So that starts in Bud's. And my swim buddy had a broken foot. He had a fracture in his foot. And he wouldn't even tell anyone because he didn't want to get medically rolled or dropped from the training. And he got through that evolution. As I was watching him, he's helping me get up and over the hill. He's helping everybody else around him. And his foot was broken. But where was his mind? You see, we can't stop thinking. We're always thinking about something. You can slow it down, but you can't turn it off. However, we can choose what we think about. And as he's focusing on his teammates and winning one race at a time, because if you win one, you might get a small break or a... Um, a snack or something to eat or whatever, a little small reward, right? So he's focused on one race at a time. He's focused on his teammates, and he's not focused on the pain in his leg, and it got him through that evolution simply by a choice in his mindset. And where I learned this was in one of the most dangerous situations I ever found myself in. We deployed overseas, and right before we deployed, my daughter was born, my very first beautiful baby girl. I spent three weeks with her, and then we went over, and we've been there for about six months, and it was time to come home. Our leadership had come in and said, pack everything up, get an inventory, and we're heading home. You've been on your last mission. Now, I love being a Navy SEAL. I love going on missions. But when it's time to come home, you start to feel excited to see your family again. You open up those, those windows emotionally. And then they come back in, and they say, hey, guys, we're going back out. We've got to go back out on one more mission. I was on a Skype call with my wife planning a trip to take my newborn daughter to Disney World when this happened. So we go back into the mission planning center, and our mission was to kill or capture a high-value terrorist leader, a very typical mission that we would go on. At the time, I was an assault reconnaissance team leader, and I would take a few Navy SEALs ahead of the main group of SEALs, and we would provide a sniper overwatch for them as they came in. And then their job was to come kick in the door of the safe house and then kill or capture this man according to how he responds when we get there. And I don't want to get into tactics too much, but I do want to paint a picture because my team was cut down. Wanting to leave a smaller footprint, my team was cut down to a handful of Navy SEALs to myself, one other Navy SEAL, and one of the soldiers in the, in the country in which we were operating. Not a bad guy, just not nearly as trained as well as we were. I didn't like that. I thought it put us at a tactical disadvantage that was unnecessary, but there was also nothing that I could do about it other than how I respond to it. We take off on the mission. We're in a city, an urban environment, a lot of buildings and streets. In the middle of the night, a night vision looks just like Call of Duty. If you play Call of Duty, it's all green and 
You can't really hide in the city, so you just move with intention and very deliberate. So that's what we're doing, just, just us three. We get to where we're going. My teammate starts putting some ladders together because we're going to scale a two- or three-story building and get on top of it to provide our overwatch. While that's happening, I peer up over a courtyard wall. Now, if we had had all the guys we would normally have, we would have surrounded them for 360-degree security, everybody looking in every direction. But we didn't have that. So I'm trying to cover everything that I can for him, and I peer up over this courtyard wall, and some people wake up, and they're sleeping outside, which is very normal. One guy wakes up, and he's got an AK-47 down by his feet, and he sees my friend, and it's just kind of a standoff. And it's like, oh, man, don't go for it, right? And he goes for it. As he goes for it, another guy get, gets up and runs, and he grabs an AK-47 out from under a blanket, I think, or off of a wall. My buddy engages the first guy. As he does that, I start tracking the other guy. And when he grabbed that weapon and he started to square off with me, and I was 100% sure he intended to engage me, I started to engage him. While we were engaging those guys, rounds started snapping by my face. And I realized that just up in front of them, so the initial contact is very close. Contact is when we get in contact with the enemy and we start shooting at each other and getting all rowdy, right? So right behind them, about 40 yards out, about four people wake up on a rooftop, and they start shooting at us. Rounds start snapping by my face, and we break straight into our playbook. It also wasn't our first rodeo, and we have ran our plays so many times we can't get them wrong. My buddy peels behind me. I tried to move forward into the contact to suppress it, not quite sure what we had up in front of us. I look over to him. And now it's my turn to move. He's going to cover fire for me, but the rounds are coming in very effective. So I drop straight to the ground as low as I could get and actually crawl towards them, towards the wall to cut off the angle. And then I turned and I started crawling to him. Not like the movies where you're crawling and, come on, guys, we can do it, right? You are the mold of the Earth's surface and just trying to scoot yourself forward and not let anything get higher than necessary because rounds were flying a few inches over my head. And he told me later he could see them flying over my head and dirt kicking up around me. I, don't remember. I knew I was getting shot at was about all I knew. And he looks at me and he says, hey, man, stop. Go back. And I was like, no way, dude. I'm coming to you. You know, because when you're afraid, you want to be near each other. He says, stop and go back. And I trusted him. So I looked over my right shoulder and I started scooting myself back. And I found a little pile of rocks that I could get behind. It's about three feet high and wide. And I get behind those pile of rocks and I can kind of compose myself for a moment. I wanted to get awareness of the situation. I looked to my right. There's a street next to me, an offset behind me a little bit. And I knew if I was the enemy, they would come up that street. And, you know, I would come up that street and flank us and, and shoot us. Now, in that moment, if we had had the additional guys that we would normally have on our team, we would have won that fight outright. Or we would have had the situational awareness coming up to it to capture those guys without waking them up, which is what we were able to do oftentimes. And that's the easy button, man. That's what you want to do, and not get all rowdy and shooting at each other and whatever. But here we are. You know, and if I pause right there, and I'm like, hey, man, you know, this is BS. <laughs> we shouldn't have been in this situation. We should have had all the guys. It's certainly natural, but it makes no sense in a gunfight, right? It's just a waste of time. And if we have the energy to complain, we've got the energy to shoot back and inspire our teammate next to us. And... That's what combat really taught me about performance. Combat eliminates the clutter because a way of doing, thinking, or interacting with your teammate when bullets are flying is either effective or it's not. And all that matters in our world is effectiveness. But if we take that same mentality and we apply it to other competitive environment, we get the same winning outcomes. So there's a pile of trash between me and this road. A big one, not like a small one, a giant one, like because there's you know no trash men in the war zone. And I use that to conceal myself. I crawl through that trash, I get to the other side, and I remember thinking, God, please don't let anybody be coming down the street. You know, we got all we can handle here. And I peer down that street briefly, and there's a group of people walking towards me, about 15 to 20. I wasn't sure what their intent was, some are armed, some are not. So wanting to follow our rules of engagement and do the morally correct thing, I fired two warning shots over their heads. And it was one of the stupidest things I've ever done in my life because when you shoot warning shots at people that want to kill you, they start shooting back. <laughs> and they know where you are. A couple of guys jumped into a car, squealed off the tires, started driving it right at me. We had a big threat of vehicle-borne IEDs, cars that would blow up. 
Again, trying to engage the engine block following rules of engagement and, and moral standards, but it doesn't work at all, no matter what you see in the movies, or at least it didn't for me, okay? So um, if you ever find yourself in that situation in the apocalypse or something, don't shoot the engine, okay? It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so I engaged the car appropriately until it became no longer a threat and had uh, kind of crashed off to the side. I'm getting further away from my teammate because that's kind of where the fight was naturally pushing me, but you don't want to get too much space because if they get in between us, we're screwed. So I start making my way back to him, and I get back to the pile of rocks that I was on, and we're trying to break contact. We're trying to get out of there, reset, regain our assets, and then reassault, right? And I get back to my pile of rocks, and we just can't. There's just too much fire coming in, so I look at my buddy and say, hey, man, just call an air, an airstrike with the helicopters. Bring it in on top of me. I'll probably be okay. But, you know, we got to do something. They wouldn't let us call in an airstrike, and so he calls in over the radio, Jason is pinned down, and you need to get up here now. And when he said that, time kind of slowed down. And I remember thinking very viscerally, not in a really fearful way, but just very real way, the actions I take next are going to determine whether I live or die. The actions that I take next in that moment were the only thing over which I had absolute control. So that's what I want to shift my focus into. Everything emotionally in our central nervous system says, hey, pay attention to this, pay attention to this, be afraid, save yourself. But we have to make that intentional focus. And we were able to make it because our preparation was so strong, the attention to detail and the relentless effort. I already knew what to do. And I could hear my instructors from training in my head telling me what to do in that moment. So I shifted my focus back into the execution of action. And I remember thinking very briefly about my little girl. And I remember at, for a moment being afraid. Thinking, am I going to lose her? Am I ever going to get home to her and see her again? But that fear quickly transitioned into aggression. We harness our emotion and we channel it into aggression. I like to think replacement. When I feel fear or doubt or self-pity, I replace it with what I need. And I thought to myself, man, this is where you wanted to be. This is what you signed up for. So do what you came here to do. Wage war, and if you get yours out here, at least let your little girl know who her daddy was. Make them pay the full price. I'm going to take as many of you with me as I can, but I'm going to make it hurt and leave your legacy. Let her know who her daddy was in this moment. And that's what I try to take with me from that experience into life, is when difficult things happen, we can control the action that we take next and the legacy that we leave behind through that action. And that's what people are really going to remember about. You know my implosion in baseball I was so embarrassed, and then some of my buddies have told me later, some of them made it to the big leagues, and you know, as we got more mature and could share things on that level, they said, you know, you never quit. You kept showing up every single day, and you kept trying until there was nowhere left to play, and I've always respected that about you, and I've never told you that, and that's not to brag on myself by any means, but it's like, that's a complete and total failure, yet people still remember what you did in it. And that's what people are going to remember about us in our various experiences that we have that are similar in, 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 uh, in the narrative. And then I shifted my focus into my teammate. So I've got myself, I've got my composure, I'm back in the fight, and I shift my focus into my teammate. And I see that guy, and he's shooting, and he's moving, and he's communicating, and he's fighting for me. And when I saw that, any remaining fear went away because I'm no longer in a prey mentality trying to protect myself from loss. I'm now in a predator mentality, hunting hunting for a cause greater than myself because, as it says in the Bible, perfect love drives out all fear. And I loved that man. And he was in a spot where he could have left me, but I knew he wasn't going to. And that trust is what created that desire to fight for each other when it matters most. And that's where the team first mind is so incredibly valuable. So one thing we talk about when I was pinned out in that fight, eventually they get an armored vehicle up to my position and... One of my teammates throws three grenades. They come up on the other side of the courtyard, and they flank the enemy in a sense. Uh, the guy who threw the grenades was Morgan Luttrell. He's a congressman in Texas, if any of you guys are familiar with him. Morgan saved my life. Those grenades went off. I was able to move, and I relink up with our assault team, the other guys. And my chief looks at me, and he says, hey, man, are you good? I said, yeah, chief, I'm good, I think. Right? Check for holes real quick. Yep, I'm good. <laughs> and he says, I said, we need to drop a bomb on this building and that building. So we can't drop bombs, man. We're going to counter assault. And I need you to go in first because you've seen it when you get the canine unit in there with you. I said, all right, I'll go. 
Now, I was terrified. Okay, we're not extraordinary people. We're ordinary people who can do extraordinary things by learning to control this and this. And that's the purpose of why I do what I do now. It's just knowledge transfer to help others. And I remember putting my laser up on the gate and focusing into that detail and what I was about to do. That's how we compartmentalize. We don't try to block things out. We only think about it more. We lock into what we're, going, what we're doing, and it brings us down a layer, and it makes everything around us white noise. Then I took a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And what I was doing was I'm letting go of what just happened. I'm releasing mental attention and emotional attachment to the past to lock into the present moment to win the fight in front of me. And I try to remember that when I've made mistakes, when I haven't done what I'm supposed to do, is I move from one to the other. You know, mental toughness is not being about being a sociopath without any feelings. It's about managing them quickly. And the faster we can make that shift is how mentally tough we are. And shifting our focus into each other is absolutely vital. The team first mentality and selfless service is often taught as a morally correct principle, and it is. But it's also a performance principle. It will help you do better. All right? We reach a higher level of performance, not only as a team, but also an individual by focusing more on others than ourselves. Here's how it works. Every day, we're driven by one of two motivations, and it's a, it's a scale. We slide up and down. You know, we, we never really perfect it, but one is status, and one is service. Status means I want to be a big deal and receive praise from other people, and there's nothing wrong with that, and it can be motivating, but when it's our foundational purpose, it drives failure. And the reason why is because for me to be a big deal, I'm dependent on other people thinking I'm a big deal. But I can't control what anybody thinks about me. So if my self-worth, if my identity is dependent on something that I can't control and can constantly change, that creates pressure. That's where we create the pressure right there. It once didn't exist and now it does. And that creates stress. And stress makes us tight and distracted. And where we want to be before we compete is relaxed but focused with a controlled aggression. And that status-driven motivation is not always out of arrogance. Sometimes it is. We had our best performer in buds. I mean, this guy was huge and could run and swim and outperform some of the instructors. And he was a great asset when things were easy. But when things would get uncomfortable for him, and that training course is hard, he would be the first one to start blaming his boat crew and complaining about everything. On Monday morning of Hell Week, I watched it do its job. I watched that man cry tears and quit the training, and we were all happy to see him go because even though he was a great performer when things were comfortable, he was going to provide or an asset. He was going to be a liability when things got difficult because he's more concerned about himself and what happens to him rather than each other and mission success. And a lot of times, so he was arrogant, I think, in my opinion. Right? He wanted to come home and tell people at the bar, hey, I'm a Navy SEAL, check me out, right? And, but that, that status-driven motivation for most people is not that way. It's out of a need for affirmation and validation from other people. And we all have a need for that somewhat in our lives because we're social creatures. We need relationship. But when it evolves into a dependency for our sense of self-worth is when it hinders our ability to perform. And I learned that about myself in sniper school. So I go to Navy SEAL sniper school, and I'm a brand new Navy SEAL. They normally would reserve it for veteran operators, but I got to go as a new guy. So I was really excited about this. But my wife had planned our wedding and set out the invitations, and we had to move the wedding back for me to go to sniper school. So that added a little bit of heat to, you know, I got to graduate, because you can fail sniper school. It happens. And when I got there... Most of the guys there are combat veterans, and they're, they're everything that I wanted to be one day. I looked up to these guys, and there was a particular test, a shooting test that I was struggling with. So I had one more chance to pass it. Me and four other guys had one more chance to pass it, or we would be kicked out of the course. We'd fail the course. One of the instructors came up to me while I was practicing, and he said, hey, man, I've watched you shoot. You understand what to do. You're a capable guy. But when you get around the other guys, you suck. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, I tried to answer him in some capacity, and he kind of interrupted me. He said, you know, what's the deal? And he said, it's the company that you're in, isn't it? And I said, yeah. And he said, listen, man, as far as this course goes, you know, yeah, those guys are accomplished. They're great dudes. But as far as this course goes, you're as good as anyone else. But if you don't believe in yourself, right, 
If you don't believe in yourself, then why should anybody else? And that was very profound to me. But then he said something else. And he said, you know, we have two wars going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we need snipers. And you're a capable shooter, but we're not going to be able to make use of your capability because you're more concerned with gaining the acceptance of your peers than simply embracing your God-given best and giving it to the team. So the next day I showed up to take this test on my last chance. I tried to focus on one shot at a time, let go, lock in, and I tried to allow my motivation to be in service to the team and country with conviction that there's purpose to whatever outcome I received, just like my implosion in baseball, and that I would learn, grow, and get better regardless of, and, and then move forward. And I was the only one who passed that test. I graduated sniper school, and I went to a, I guess an advanced tactical school, you would call it, and sniper school from there, and me and my shooting buddy won top sniper. More so due to him than me, but we both performed pretty well and won, you know, top sniper. And I thought to myself, you know, nothing really changed in the fundamentals of how I fired my weapon. The only thing that really changed was the shift in my mindset into service to the team. So I wanted to peel back the layers of that and figure out how that works. Because a team first mindset had a direct impact on my individual ability to execute in high pressure. So how does it work? Well, when we have a service-based mentality, when we serve the team, it creates two performance values. One, it reduces our fear to a minimal level, our anxiety. And the second is it creates at least trust and ultimately love within each other. And those are the most effective motivators of aggression. And aggression is what we need when we compete. So how does it work? When we're in our ready room, it's like a locker room in sports. You, know, you got your little cubby, but, and you got your helmet, and you got your body armor, and your gun, and you're getting ready, and you start to think, wow, what if, you know, what if something bad happens out here tonight? What if I get killed or worse? That fear is feeding off of self-concern. What's going to happen to me? It's like a parasite feeding off of self-concern. So if I defer my concern to the well-being of teammate and mission success, it has nothing to latch on to because perfect love drives out all fear. And as we interact with each other in a selfless manner, helping each other with our gear, helping each other with mission planning, helping, we're focused on each other, and we're acting in accordance with that, it then creates the feelings, the emotions of trust and love. But the action creates the emotion in that order and in that order only. So in our core values, mission statements, which are vital to have, but we have to live it in order to feel it. It can't just be words or a slogan on a t-shirt. We live it and then we feel it, and when we feel it, it's incredibly powerful and I can prove it. If I gave you the chance to come up here and fight me, we're a fist fight, and if you win the fight, you can go tell everybody you took down a Navy SEAL, the status of that. Would anyone want to fight me? Nobody, okay. Now let's change the motivation. Think of the person you love the most in this world. And now imagine I have that person behind me and you've got to come through me to get to him or you never see him again. Who would fight me now? Everybody would, right? And not only would you fight, you would probably find a way to win because in that situation, you're not fighting for self-gain and status. You are fighting for something greater than yourself. But that feeling about that person that would motivate that action didn't just pop out of thin air with magic. It was created by meeting an expectation and a standard over the course of time. And to me, that's what brotherhood was all about. People ask me, what did brotherhood mean to you and the SEAL teams? And at first, I didn't answer it well, and I thought through it, and this is what it meant. It didn't mean we agreed with each other all the time, and it didn't mean we liked each other all the time. That's not how a team works. It meant we were able to set aside our differences to serve a greater and common cause. That's how a team works. We serve a greater and common cause and a standard in which to achieve it. And the more difficult, the more discipline it takes to achieve that standard, the more trust you build within each other, ultimately love, and the more desire you have to fight for each other when things are at their worst. And that's what every team has a choice of, one of those three things. The losers work against each other, the status quo works with each other, and elite teams fight for each other because it's how winning is done, and it pays to be a winner. And in my opinion, when people ask, you know, what is it that makes you guys so good? That's really it right there. That's what it is. And that's what I miss about it so very much and getting to be around guys like that every single day. And the best that I can do now is share those experiences to help others achieve. And that's my purpose. But that team first mentality is not 
natural. We established that at the beginning. We are self-preserving creatures. Survival instincts kick in. And I don't get this right every day, but I try to. So we've got to, in the small things that we do every day, we've got to create this habit until it becomes innate in our being, in our character. So what they taught us to say in our heads when we would patrol, one of the phrases through self-talk is, if I get shot at right now, what will I do to support my buddy? So when something bad happens, not whose fault is it, not how can I deflect responsibility, but what action am I going to take to work the problem in support of my teammate? And when everybody's functioning with that mindset, with incredible preparation, and it goes off, we've got them beat before they even knew what happened. And then when they square up, right, they've got to be willing to take every single one of us out. It's a hard fight for them to win. So the team first mentality, it's the solution, but it's also the challenge. Because it does come from a place of vulnerability. Everyone has to make the decision, and we don't know what the others are going to choose. But I believe that's truly how we have an impact on everyone else is through the example that we set. That's how we can, can make a mark on other people and help try, start to create that within our teams. Where I saw this come out innately in somebody's character was in one of the more emotionally impactful events of my life, and that was in a helicopter crash. This is a real picture of it right here. We were doing something called Visit Board Search and Seizure, VBSS, it's dangerous. And the idea is to take down a ship. And this was a training operation. We were practicing. And we had two helicopters and we had boats coming at the ship. There's a lot of moving parts. The picture is in the day. This was taking place at night. My helicopter was the first one. We rode down onto the ship and we started making movement. All of a sudden, I felt a gust of hot air. I, I heard this really loud noise of twisting metal, which I didn't know what it was at the time, just this awful noise, and I felt debris hitting my gear. I ran to the fantail of the ship, right kind of where that line is right here, and I peered around the corner, and when I turned around the corner, I saw parts of the helicopter falling off into the ocean. I saw an explosion in the background, of a fireball, and it registered to me that the helicopter was crashing with all of my friends on it. When we got up to the crash site, there were a lot of people wounded and injured. I went up to one of our guys who was lying on his back. He had shattered his tailbone. I didn't, we didn't really know what his injuries were exactly at first. He was one of our medics, a corpsman, we call him. And I watched his eyes roll into the back of his head, and he went unconscious. Somebody else was working on him, so I moved over, and I got to our other medic. So a lot of our medical expertise was down hard. He had shattered his hips. We found out later he had broken them completely in half in multiple places, his pelvis. And he's lying on his back. And with him having, we all have some medical training, but they're the experts. And I said, how do we fix you? What do we do, brother? But before he would give me any information on how to provide aid or treatment for him, he started telling us how to locate, prioritize, and treat the other wounded members of our team. Only after he had given us that information did he say, hey, I've shattered my hips. I've probably cut my femoral artery, and I'm going to bleed out and die in about 20 minutes if you don't get me to surgery. So we're going to get you there. But we'd used all the stretchers on all the other guys, and we couldn't drag them because we'd certainly kill them. So me and another man went running through the ship trying to find a stretcher, something that we could put them on. And it was kind of like one of those bad dreams where you're not getting anywhere. You know, we're running, and we're running, and we're running. And we finally find one, and we get up there, and we, we get them, and we carefully put them on it, and we strap them down. Then we've got to carry them, you know, down these steps. And it was hard. And we, we got them there very carefully. We got them onto the helicopter. We get to the helicopter. The pilots are concerned about weight, so we're ditching body armor and everything we can, trying to calculate it on our heads. We get on. We're riding. The helicopter comes down close to the water at some point. I grab my, mat, my uh, oxygen tank so that we're going in the drink and uh, eventually made it, came back out to the ship to assist again. And it was, uh, it, was, it was tough. But, you know, that guy went to surgery, and he lived. And, and he's still in, actually. He's a medical officer at one of the SEAL teams. And I, I think about that moment a lot because in that moment, his life was on a running clock with an unknown amount of time. Yet he still took the time to place his teammates ahead of himself. And that's not a decision that's made in the moment. Selflessness was a trait he had made innate in his character until he didn't know how to be anything different. My man was just working the problem according to who he had made himself to be. And it's powerful. And I remember looking at him, and I could see his face. And I knew in that moment that that man would die for me without hesitation. And when you look at a man, and you can see in his eyes that he would give his life for you without hesitation, you trust that man. 
And that trust is what gives us the courage to get back out into hell every single day and take the fight to him. It's how winning is done, and it pays to be a winner. And that's extreme for us, but it's what motivates and drives everything that we do. They say the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And again, it's not a sermon, but I do try to remember this every day, okay, is that we all serve something, whether we recognize it or not. And if we want to achieve success and fulfillment in our lives and in our businesses, we focus on each other. Not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's going to reduce our fear and it's going to create trust within the team. And then when things get difficult, we're going to respond to the adversity well and we're going to fight for each other because it's how winning is done. And in those high pressure moments, it's not always easy. And sometimes we've got to figure out how to bring our composure back down. But before I get into that, let's talk about this. This is him in the hospital. He goes down to a rehab facility in Florida, and they tell him, they send pro athletes, Navy SEALs there, and they tell him it's going to be a couple of years or so before you're up and moving, and we're going to give you a medical retirement from the Navy. He would get a pension and could exit from the Navy, and it is an easy, comfortable route out. I mean, I, if I was in that situation, I don't know what I would do. I, I may have taken it, but he didn't. He said, nope, that's for the status quo. That's not me, man. My team's going overseas, and we're down bodies because of the helicopter crash, and we need, and he was an experienced dude. So, you know, I need to be there for these guys. Within less than a year, he gets himself operationally cleared by the medical staff, meets us on deployment a few months later, and I told those stories in reverse because the way this curriculum works, mental toughness is a shift into the team. But the helicopter crash happened before the gunfight that I told you about. He was the same guy that was in that gunfight with me on the recce team who was shooting, moving, and communicating, and he saved my life with screws still fresh in his hips because he was resilient, because he knew who he was, and he knew what his purpose was, and because he was mentally tough, refused to accept the status quo, shifted his focus, and he was driven by love for his teammates. And it created this rehabilitation process that blew everyone away. Nobody could figure it out. And then he saved my life. I love that guy. And so that's him in the hospital. And then when we meet ourselves in, in, in high-pressure moments like that, and we need to bring our composure down, because we all get nervous. It's human nature. How do we manage that? I actually developed this with a, a guy who was playing for the Yankees. And he was playing behind A-Rod and Teixeira, and he was struggling because he was towards the end of his career. He said, man, i got to get a hit every time, or I'm never going to, you know, my career's going to be over. And that threat was very real, but it was creating pressure, and he was failing. So I said, man, the first thing you have to do is you have to free yourself from the requirement of the outcome. He said, what do you mean? I just stopped caring? I said, no, not at all. We just reduce it back to something that's attainable. You know, if you get three hits out of ten, you're in the Hall of Fame with a 300 batting average, and you're placing a standard upon yourself of success every single time to bat a thousand, which nobody has ever done. So you're under all of that pressure. Your job isn't to get a hit every time because nobody can achieve that. If that was your job, nobody would have one in the big leagues. Your job is to be the best hitter you can be one pitch at a time. You do that, your natural talent will take care of the rest. So that's what he did. And then the next thing I told him, I said, men, be thankful. You know, high achievers, we tend to focus on where we want to get to next. And we should, but sometimes we need to stop and recognize how much we've overcome and what we've accomplished. And they said, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen to you today is you're going to walk into Yankee Stadium and take batting practice. And I know you want more than that, and you should want more than that, want more than that but that's worst case scenario, man. And that's something, it's a unique experience that I'll never have, that most people will never have. So when you look at the crowd, instead of allowing them to freak you out and make you nervous, appreciate them. Because your worst heckler in the stands and your harshest media critic in the papers would trade spots with you in a moment. And I learned that in the SEAL teams too when I would get frustrated, when I would get afraid or nervous or distracted, I would bring it back. Like This is a very unique experience that not many people get to do. We got called into the Mission Planning Center one time and I was just, everything was moving faster than I was. And we're on the helicopters, and I just hadn't caught up with myself yet. You guys ever feel that way? You're just halfway through the day, and it's like, I don't even have clarity yet. And I, and I, and I was anxious. I wasn't clear. And then my buddy's in the helicopter. Country, we called him, because he, he's a big country dude. And he's on the night vision, I could see his teeth shining through. You know, and he's got a big old mouth and a big old fist. He's a big old guy, and he's, big, and he's just giving me a big fist bump. 
And I fist bump him back, and he's smiling and nodding his head like, this is awesome, right? And I sit on the helicopter with my legs hanging off, and I look down at my weapon, and I look down at the city below me, and I knew exactly why I was there. And I love these guys that I was on this helicopter with. And I thought to myself, man, if I get mine out here, what a better way to go. I mean, who gets to do this right now? And I got into this state of gratefulness, and it brought me back down because thankfulness is the tactical nuclear weapon to negativity in our minds. It clears it out because you can't be grateful and negative at the same time. They oppose each other. You have to choose one or the other. So to feel that when we're not there is to think of someone who'd like to be right where you're at. Startups are hard. I get that. And sometimes it can feel overwhelming. When we think about how far we've come and how many, so many people would love to own and operate their own business and then get ourselves back in the fight and lead our teams. And the, sec the last thing I told them was walk strong to the plate even if you don't feel it. When you're walking through cities where it feels like everyone there wants to kill you, it's easy to start getting the Scooby-Doo walk, right? And you're like, all right. So you walk strong, and then the emotions will catch back up. Walk strong to the plate, and when you get there, say something that sparks confidence in your mind and makes you feel like you, man. And that's what he did. And he got a ton of hits, hit a bunch of home runs, and it was featured in the New York Times. And, uh, and it worked for him, just the shift in mentality. But nothing changed about how he swung his bat or his pitch selection. The only thing that changed was in his mindset and in his motivation. I really learned this in one of the most fearful moments I've been in. So when you're in combat, is it scary? Sort of. It happens so fast, you think about it later a lot of times. What I was the most scared was in Buds. And I'll finish with this story. In Buds, we're at the end of the six months now. So Hell Week was about five months ago. We've been through all of this training. There's light at the end of the tunnel. We graduate the next week, and this is the last thing we have to do. We're on an island called San Clemente Island. Students call it the island where no one can hear you scream. And our last evolution is to swim one mile at night through a great white shark feeding ground. We come into a classroom, and they turn on videos of people getting attacked by sharks. We watch those videos. If that's not hard enough, we come out, we get in a line, they've got a bucket of blood, from fish guts and blood from where they had fished, they had been fishing and filleted all the fish. And they started taking that bucket of blood with a soup ladle and pouring it all over us, down our wetsuits. I was a slower swimmer in the class, so one of the instructors grabbed a whole fish and he shoved it in my cargo pocket. He said, you're a slow swimmer, Karen, you need extra motivation. Put this fish in your pocket, buttoned it up, and he said, you can't dump it. You've got to give it back to me when you're done with the swim. <laughs> and it worked. I swam really fast. <laughs> Simple is effective. So we've got blood all over us. We've got a fish in my pocket. We start running. We've got to run about a mile to get where we're going to enter the water and do the swim. And as we're running down there to do the swim, normally you would hear people telling jokes, giving each other a hard time, or whatever it may be, but this time all you heard was footsteps, just, we were terrified. 20 dudes, terrified, running down to the beach, but nobody's going to quit because we're too close to graduating. We're going to do the swim, and then all of a sudden my buddy throws his hands up in the air in his thick New England accent, and he says, I can't do the accent, I'm not even going to try, he's like, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, as he's running. So quite a few of us joined in with him on the prayer. That's a good idea right now, brother. Right? <laughs> Some of the other dudes are, hey, guys, how do the words to the prayer go so we can say it too? It's a too late for you guys, right? And, uh, but the whole energy in the class changed from fear to aggression. You know, guys were jumping into the water, pulling out their knife. I'm going to hunt a shark. Where's one at? Trying to find one, whatever. And as I was watching these guys, my brothers that have been forged through extreme amounts of adversity for the last six months and the bond that was built in that with blood all over them, laughing and hopping in the water with knives out or whatever, I just started smiling and I thought, you know, nobody even really knows where I am right now. And that's okay. I said, I love these guys. There was nowhere I'd rather be than right here, right now. And my heart was full of gratefulness. And as it was full of gratefulness to be deemed worthy to hold the line with these guys, to be a part of what we're doing, to forge ourselves into warriors, to go fight for meaningful purpose and protect the innocent, I, I was just, it just, I felt I was calm. And that's what I realized is when we're grateful, we're calm. 
And we need to be calm, relaxed, but focused with a controlled aggression in order to execute in high pressure. And that's what happened. Now we get in the water and you start swimming. And I tried to focus on three things. I focused on my effort, how hard I was swimming. I focused on my swim buddy, my teammate's well-being. And we focused on the direction that we were going. And if you focus on those three, three things, you know, to narrow all this down into that, what can really go wrong? When you get in the water, you know, if you let your mind drift, it's real easy to start thinking about the sharks. But I can't control whether a shark eats me or not. And if I focus on that, I'm going to be constantly fearful. And if we live our lives that way, that's how it's going to be as well. So if we shift our focus into the effort that we give, into our teammates' well-being, whether it's your business, whether it's your family, whether it's your friend, and going in the right direction, you really can't lose because there's purpose to everything that we go through. And when we do the right things, the right things always work out over the course of time. And I know that to be true because of what happened here. That's me and Tyler at the World Series Championship. When everybody said it was hopeless and he can't get back into baseball and that I was done, right? And there we are standing on Truist Field just full of joy. And why? Did, why? Because the struggle was so great. That's why it felt so good. But even more, what felt better than that was I did get home to Disney World. There it is. That's my beautiful baby girl right there. Okay. And, uh, so I got home. That's about one week after that fight. So I'm still a little steely-eyed. And when you walk through the gates of the Magic Kingdom after something like that, and the lady looks at you and says, have a magical day, it's... <laughs> takes a minute, you know, figure it out. But. Anyway, thank you all very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. To thank you. Um, so, Jason, do you want to take it? Does anyone have a question? Yeah, I'd be happy for, to answer some questions. We have, what, about 10 minutes, 9 minutes, it looks like, on the clock there. So I'd be happy to take questions. Um, if you could use the microphone for them, because I can't hear. Yeah. Uh, I have one right off the bat. Myself. Say it again. I have one right off the bat myself. Oh, go ahead. So um, the discipline of these fundamentals uh, as a SEAL, as they're taught in the Navy, the military, um, translating that into corporate America, it seems like post-COVID, with employment challenges, and we all, our own internal employees and temp labor that we all put out there, it seems like we've had to reduce the standards somewhat in some cases. And how does maintaining that higher level of discipline translate into success? Yeah, I think that discipline is the foundational element of commitment. And we all want to be more committed ourselves, but how do we create you know, committed employees and increase engagement within them, especially when things get difficult you know, with, with the things you were describing there. So the way I define commitment is it's discipline to fundamental principles in the face of uncontrollable circumstances. And discipline, as it was taught to me by one of our instructors, is doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it. It's doing, so it's an action, it's a verb, and all actions require a motivation. And our motivation, our desire, fuels our discipline. So the more desire I have, the more discipline I can apply. So if we know that to be true, it's well, where does desire come from and how do I create that within other people? Desire, I believe, comes from meaningful purpose, or at least that's where it is most effective, the meaningful purpose. So meaningful purpose fuels our desire, which feeds our discipline and then increases our commitment or our engagement across the board. So the key is, as leaders, is finding out what is meaningful to other people. Now, there's some differences in the nuances between a combat team and special operations, perhaps a professional athlete, and the corporate world, right? And say, in professional athletics, you have someone who has worked incredibly hard um, and then is now living out a dream. And you know they're very self-motivated people because they truly love what they're doing. I mean, for, and, and then in combat, you have very, or, or in special operations, you have very self-motivated individuals who have put themselves through hell to be on this team. The other thing is combat, because it's life and death, forces that discipline. You know, I don't want to die, and neither does my teammate. And so any differences we may have 
before we go get in a fight, become obsolete. We're not going to allow that to interrupt our ability to serve each other, make each other better, and win the day because we're relying on each other to survive. That is not the same in the corporate environment, right? So we want to honor those differences so that we create effective solutions. And so for me, a lot of times with our employees, this may not be their dream job, okay? Most places I've worked, lots of, if, you, if you stop paying me, I'm probably going to stop showing up, right? You know? and, uh, but there's something that motivates them to show up. Providing for their family, you know, trying to make their way through the ranks to the next position, uh, gaining experience, whatever it is. And the, the hard part is, is it may be a little bit different for each individual person. But as the leader, that's why, that's why you are where you are. You, you're the one that, you know, that's why you get the big bucks. You're the one that has to be able to engage those things. I look at it in three things. I think that uh, one, transparency in decision making is vital. It also has a blind spot. The more information we give up can be used as, you know, can be a vulnerability because it can be used against you if employees leave and turnover rates are high. So it's balancing that. Empowerment. We had a young new guy on our team and he was driving me crazy. And so I just gave him a bunch of work to do. And he was fantastic because he wanted to know that as a team leader, I valued that guy. And that was it for him, right? So empowerment. In the same way, if we empower people without explaining the intention behind it, and we can only empower according to our capability, um, well, why am I getting all this extra responsibility without matching compensation or whatever it may be? So we've got to make sure all the pieces are in place, right? So there's, there's blind spots to each. So transparency, um, empowerment, and then just compensation. But compensation can be in different forms. Some people like a plot with their name on it. Some people like more money. Some people like more time off. But figuring out what those details are and what motivates a person, I believe, will increase their uh, desire, which will fuel their discipline. And then maintaining that as you go. So. Thank you. Anyone have a question? More? I have to thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you all very much. Thank you.